All right, we are live on YouTube and at 7.31 p.m. We'll call this regular April 2021 meeting of the Reading Board of Education to order. It is Tuesday, April 6th, 2021, being held remotely pursuant to Executive Order 7B. All seven members of the board are present, as well as from the administration, Dr. Harris and Dr. Pearson Ugal, Mr. Zachary from Central Office. I see Ms. Hammond, Mr. Amodio from RES, Ms. Del Conte from Special Education, and Mrs. Wallen, and now Dr. Amori for John Reed. First item of business is the approval of minutes for March 2nd, March 12th, and March 29th. Starting with March 12th, are there any comments or questions with respect to those minutes? March 2nd, actually, right? Yep. First, there is yep. a mistake. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. So the number for the budget is incorrect. It is off by a million dollars. So it's supposed to be, so this is, uh, excuse me, page three, maybe a third of the quarter of the way down. It should say 23,249,211. So we'd correct those minutes to be 23,249,211. And I also would comment on the March 2nd minutes in Heather's comment on page two, there's a comment about she said this further results in a lower threshold expectation of these districts. I think that was intended to mean a lower threshold for excess cost reimbursements. Heather is nodding. Um, yes. Any other, any other questions or comments on the March 2nd? Minutes, if there aren't, I'd look for a motion to accept them as subject to those two amendments. Chris Hawker, is there a second? A second. Heather, thank you. Uh, anyone opposed or any objection? Hearing none, we'll deem those that motion approved by unanimous consent to move on to the March 12th, 2021 meeting minutes. Any questions or comments on the March 21 meeting minutes? Any questions or comments on the March 29th meeting minutes? Absent objection, we'll deem both of those approved by unanimous consent also and move on to item three of the agenda, public comment. Members of the public wishing to make comment, please indicate so by using the reactions button to raise your hand or otherwise make yourself known. Seeing none, move on to board member comment. I have something. Colleen? Um, I believe, I, although we've met once or twice since the public hearing, I believe that we neglected as a board to thank um, you, Chris, and Dr. Harrison and um, Clarence for presenting at the public hearing. Um, I was, I felt very proud to have you um, represent us. I thought the presentation was very um, thorough and um, it really told the story of um, our budgeting process, which I really appreciate. And it's the first time I heard that Dr. Harrison quoted Deming when he was um, being interviewed. That is a quote from my past and um, I, I love the shout out. And um, so I just wanted to make sure that I expressed my appreciation for what you guys put together there. Thank you, Colleen. Any other board member comment? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to the assistant superintendent's report. Dr. Pearson Ugal. Yes, thank you. I have two things that I'd like to mention briefly this evening. The first is uh, an update about our summer programming. Um, I'm pleased to say that we've been meeting on a regular basis, both with um, officials with the town and the Mark Twain Library and our counterparts in Easton, and also with our teachers to discuss possible summer programming and to confirm uh, classes and the logistics of making this happen. So I just want the board members and the public to know that we are, we are working hard on this effort and we are hoping that when we return from April break, we'll be able to provide uh, more information in an official communication. 
So the offerings will likely include um, mostly in-person sessions, but also possibly a few remote sessions as well. Uh, do you want to take any questions on that before you go? About the, uh, <laughs> the summer programming? Yep, sorry about that. So um, we have, um, uh, we've been talking about the federal funding uh, for uh, coronavirus relief or COVID relief. Um, there are two pockets of, fundings that, uh, of funding sources that we have. One is ESSER II. Uh, and then the second that we are anticipating is um, the, the rescue funds, um, the COVID rescue funds. We are looking to um, use a substantial portion of our ESSER II funds uh, to subsidize our summer programming. Uh, we feel like this is really an opportunity um, for, for uh, to, to engage our students in learning activities that will be fun. Um, and uh, get them uh, excited about school and continue to keep them excited about school. Um, it would be, just be a good way to keep that connection going over the summer and, uh, and, and really uh, laying out a plan so that we are able to uh, offer this summer programming or this subsidized summer programming uh, over the course of two summers, um, given that we'll have two years to spend this money. Uh, and then uh, there are some other planning in the uh, initial planning in the work. And I think I mentioned this at one of our previous meetings just around acceleration and supporting our uh, teachers in that process uh, as we go forward. Um, but uh, really looking at uh, investing our, um, some, uh, some of those funds in our teachers' professional learning uh, and looking at a, a process to do, that, to do that. But I do wanna share um, uh, some of the plans related to the summer programming. Uh, given that Dr. Percy Eugle was going to mention that tonight. And with respect to the summer, I don't remember if this has come up in a board meeting or not, but there was a survey that went out to families with respect to their interest. And my understanding is that the response was significant. It was, it was indeed. So I don't have those numbers in front of me, but there was a very positive report of response from our parents, both in Reading and also in Easton. The, the vast majority of parents uh, expressed an interest in in-person programs, but I will say that um, the interest spanned the grades, really, from, from K through eight. Um, and there was also a range of interest from um, more of an academic focus to, to more of an enrichment focus. So again, the response was extremely positive. And, and what sort of percentage response were you getting? I mean, what, what was the size of the sample, would you say? I want to say that there were around 300 responses. And again, I, I <laughs> wish I brought had that paperwork in front of me. I, I do not. Was it the same person 300 times? Or? <laughs> There's going to be one child who is very well enriched. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Chris's cat. So. <laughs> it's my cat, yeah. So the any second other? part of my report yep. is a, a total gear shift. So if there are any other questions about, about summer, I'm happy to hear those? Okay, in that case, I also want to follow up um, about the middle school NWEA testing. At our last meeting, um, I shared with all of you that we would be doing a non-standard administration of the uh, NWEA uh, uh, reading and math assessment for our students at John Reed this year. And when I say non-standard, um, what I mean is that we administered the assessment early quite intentionally. So while we didn't have enough weeks for it to be considered within the, um, the end of year spring window of assessment, we wanted to do this so that we could um, have a longer period of time with the students to intervene and, and work with them while school is still in session. Really, frankly, less worried about the actual number on the assessment and, and more interested in, in how we can support and extend our students in all different ways. So those results are back. They will be going home to parents by the end of this week. Um, but we're also in the process of of analyzing those results. And in some cases, we have some questions about the results where it doesn't seem on par with what we're seeing in school. And in one grade in particular, the assessment was given when um, the teachers in that grade level were in quarantine. 
So there are some questions about, about the validity of that measure. So the uh, John Reed staff is following up to do some um, not reassessments because we don't frankly want to put the students through the entire standardized measure again, but um, some shorter assessments to just confirm the information so that again, our, our intervention and our extension is appropriate. And so parents should expect to see those results home at the end of the week. Any question on the assessments? Um, can you give a little clarification on what the expectations or processes are for Smarter Balance this year, which I understand is coming back? Yes, we will be administering the Smarter Balanced assessment in uh, May. So I'm going to look to Darlene for the, the more exact time frame of the assessment, but in the month of May. And uh, the state fully expects us to participate. So there will be a secure browser in place so that students from home, students who are learning from home will be able to come into school for testing. And, and I believe the parent letters either have already gone home or will come home in the next couple of days. And um, students who are at home may also take the assessment at home. Again, there's a, there's a secure window that will allow that assessment to occur in either location. Thank you. We do not know exactly um, what form the results will take or when we will receive them. So in the last typical year that we had, 2018-19, we received our results in June and that was very useful to us. So while the results weren't um, official until much later in the summer, the school teams were able to really work with that information to, um, to help plan the fall. We don't know, um, again, what the, what the timing of these results will be. There's no reason why it should be very different, but again, we've, we've had other surprises this year, so we will see. Just to follow up to Stephanie, we're looking at starting tests the week of May 17th um, and trying to run like a, a delayed schedule. The kids will be in school, but we'll meet all of their classes after some testing. Um, and hopefully that will make it a little bit easier. So everybody's testing at the same time. Since we have, we are one-to-one -one now, it makes it a lot easier for us. Yeah, we're no longer fighting for Chromebooks during the testing. Correct. And running them from grade to grade, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I hope this would go, uh, go without saying, but um, if there's any uh, common trends in those results that our board um, could help alleviate or direct resources towards, um, you know, please uh, let us know as soon as possible so that we can help our students. Yeah. I think that's an excellent use of some of the, the COVID recovery money to the extent we identify specific deficits. That's what it's there for. Thank you. Any other questions for Stephanie tonight? All right, thank you. Uh, on to building administrative reports. Start with RES and Ms. Hammond. Hello, everybody. Um, Thank goodness for spring is all I have to say. Um, the opportunity for kids to be outside, the warmer weather, and, and really truly a rebirth and renewal. Um, the learning that's happening is exciting. I hope you either had a chance or will have a chance to take a look at the specific examples that my teams have presented to you of things that are happening. I mean, we have kindergartners writing how-to books and reading them back and able to tell you every step of the way on what they did to create this book on their own. Um, we have second graders who are engineers creating, using uh, solid materials, homes for the Three Little Pigs Friend, because we want to make sure that Three Little Pigs Friend is safe too. We have fourth graders writing literary essays based on historical texts. I mean, holy cow. Um, it's just really exciting to see. And I, I hope you get an opportunity to take a look and, and really embrace the work that is happening. Our teachers and our students are working so hard um, and, and really just, just doing some amazing work. Um, and it's unfortunate that we can't have you visiting the buildings, but we have some super cool um, literary artwork up in the fourth grade wing uh, that I just was such an eye. I was stopping by taking a look at some of them. That is just fascinating work. Um, people just just really, really um, embracing the learning right now. So um, we, we will continue to showcase that. And I know Darlene shared the dates for Smarter Balance assessments at John Reed. Ours are slightly different. So right at the end of 
me speaking, I'll pass it over to Joe and he'll give a, some specifics on our dates because uh, they're a, a slightly different, um, not, not drastically, but slightly different. And we only have, as you may be aware, third and fourth grade who will be taking those assessments. Um, the other thing that's been pretty neat, um, visiting even our youngest friends. So oftentimes we think, oh, but it's preschool. Um, our three and fours, I have to tell you, I, I do quite enjoy myself going in there because 99% um, of the time my timing is perfect and we're doing dancing and movement breaks and singing and just wonderful fun activities. But one of the things I really wanted to capture, we talk, we're talking so much in our tri-district about diversity. Um, and the inclusiveness and the individual, individuality that we all have, it's happening in our three-year-olds classrooms. So I just wanted to really showcase that as it's never too early to start. And for families at home too, our children are brilliant little human beings and their ears are always taking things in and listening. And the work that's happening in even our youngest grades at our school is really fascinating, really talking about the word diversity and talking really about what makes us special and unique and what makes us awesome. Um, so I just, I just thought that was neat to share because yes, we have our high schoolers who are, are, their voices are loud and proud and strong and they're knowledgeable, but we're starting as early as three and really engaging in these conversations. And I know we love talking shop with enrollment. Um, <laughs> four new students started with us on Monday, three from out of, out of state, uh, I'm sorry, out of town and one uh, returning to us from um, homeschooling options. So uh, the numbers that you see on there, even since we handed it in have changed. So we are four more as of uh, the report that you see in front of you, two more in first grade and two more in fourth grade. And we're just loving it. We're loving welcoming fr uh, friends and families back as they feel comfortable doing so um, and welcoming new families in from the outside. So that's all I have to share and I'll pass it over to Joe to get the update on smarter balanced states that are a little different than John Reed. Before we get to Joe, Natalie, while we're on enrollment, yeah. what do you have an update on kindergarten packets and what our sort of projections are heading towards there? Yeah, I do. So right now, as of today, we have 68 definites. We have uh, several uh, that we are waiting. Um, well, we have, we have a handful who we are waiting on. We have some families who are making a decision uh, that who might have children who are born in the fall months, deciding is this the year, are they gonna wait till the next year? I actually have a phone conversation tomorrow with a parent who said, I don't think I'm gonna send them and now I'm having a conversation tomorrow that they will be sending them in September. Our numbers are changing. Um, and again, these the move-ins. So we are still waiting and I know Bobby Grenskog has sent out some additional mailings and information to our local, um, I, I wanna say news, uh, but definitely the News Times, we shared it with Hello Reading, um, just trying to get that information out there. And because our, our Prada projections are much higher than what we have right now. And I do have a feeling there's going to be some movement as, um, as, as things start changing in our, in our, in our culture and our society. And, and, you know, with COVID changing and with uh, buildings reopening and um, things being lifted. So uh, this year's a tricky year uh, to kind of forecast, but I have a feeling based on Prouda, uh, we are close to 100 on the Prouda projection and we're in the low 70s right now and what we're looking at. So stay tuned. <laughs> well, I will keep you updated as we go. Like I said, we also have some families who have either done private K um, and are saying, huh, we might want to do another year of K, but with you guys, we have some people saying, um, my child's been home most of the year this year and geez, you know, we'd like another experience of K. So we might see that. Um, so yeah, stay tuned and come May, I will be sure to have another update for you. And I do expect that number, it, it is changing on a weekly basis for us. So. I feel like this isn't far off from where we were last year at right. this time. And we still hit the, the low nineties right. when it all ended. So. Right. Correct. Joe? Uh, just to clarify, the assessment dates for RES, slightly different, but not very different compared to John Reed. Um, at our school, all third and fourth graders will complete the assessments. We're planning to begin ours on Tuesday, May 4th. Um, during that week, students will work to complete the English language arts assessment. 
um, over a, a series of days. So short chunks of time over about two or three days. And then the week after the week of May 10th, students will complete uh, both of the math sections of the assessment, um, the math computer adaptive assessment, um, and the, also the math performance task the following week. And then the week of the 17th, we have reserved for uh, any makeups. We did send our letter out to all third and fourth grade families yesterday. And then we followed up with a letter to specifically our cohort C families uh, this afternoon, um, encouraging them and inviting them to come into the building in an alternate loca location to complete the assessment. Thank you both. Any questions from the board on the RES report? Um, I just real quickly, uh, I noticed as well, Natalie, thank you for highlighting it, but I noticed as well the um, special work that's going on in preschool. But what I also noticed was um, even though we keep talking about this new normal and how life has changed, um, I, I was um, really touched how normal um, each grade's activities have remained. Um, it was like a walk down memory lane, really for me remembering what my daughter experienced. And um, so I think it's really an accomplishment that our staff has been able to hold on to RES traditions um, given the new normal, um, not only for a, a, you know, a parent to um, reminisce about what their child experienced, but how siblings um, who's um, maybe a younger sibling is going through RES at a different time than an older sibling that they're having so many um, common experiences still, even though we've been so impacted by COVID. So um, I, I, I loved reading that report and, um, and seeing that those traditions are still very active in the schools. Thank you. Thank you so much for recognizing that because I, I couldn't agree with you more. Yes, we've had to maybe look at things a little bit differently or, 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 or zoom in a little bit more, or prioritize a little bit differently, but yeah, that's been important to our teachers um, in, in holding on to many of those traditions, but also um, ensuring that there is that, that similar experience despite the year that we've had. Um, and again, kudos to our staff for that and the kids are rocking it. So thank you for recognizing that. Any other questions, comments on the RES report? Seeing none, can thank you both. Move on to John Reed, Dr. Amori. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm sitting here listening to my esteemed colleague, Natalie. Um, and I, when I hear your excitement um, about the little ones, um, it, it also got me thinking about um, my job, uh, as I see it um, each month, is to really give you sort of like the inside scoop. I mean, I, I love the reports that we put together for you, but like, what does it really mean? What does it feel like? How are we experiencing some of these things, you know, as part of the John Reed um, community. So, like, so for example, we have um, a stable um, enrollment, but we've had some shifts in our cohort C. Um, we got hit pretty hard. Um, you know, you probably know about that. Um, so, several of our students are now quarantining. Um, they're, they'll be coming back starting tomorrow. So, uh, so now we have like 22% of our students in cohort C, and that makes it that's a di different feel across certain grade levels in certain classrooms. Um, but the good news is, um, when we come back to spring break, you know, we anticipate we'll be down to 11%. And, and to continue that theme, um, tomorrow is always an exciting day for me on Wednesday because I get to meet with my home base. I have an eighth grade and a fifth grade home base. And I have a steady crew of eighth graders and we get online and it's about 10 minutes, but it's always about, you know, what, how's it going for you? What's it like for you? And I learn so much from them. And what I'm constantly reminded of, and this is why it's such a a beauty to have a smaller size school. Do you know, um, we, we may have stereotypes in our head excuse me, our head, what's it like to be learning from home? It's over a year for, for these children, right? They're all different. They all have a very different take on it, right? So one young lady, she's thrilled to be home. She's more organized. She gets her work done. She's not distracted. I mean, she's Grace and another young man, a and what he basically said to me was, he's you know, and I hear and he's find ways to overcome that. But it just um, it, it just reminds me that um, our job always is to connect with our students as individuals. Am I, I am I okay still with the? Um, are you hearing me okay? It's coming gonna, in I'm and out. I'm going to move myself. 
<laughs> okay, I'm going to move closer to my, um, I'm so sorry, I'm going to move closer to my um, router. I'm trying to give the rest of the household some privacy, but I'm going to move and see if this is going to help. Uh, let's see. Oh, now I'm completely in the dark. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, yeah. Grace under pressure. Grace under pressure. Wait. Okay. This, this is a little bit better. Okay. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention is if you look at our report, we have, um, you know, the activities that we represented there, they're all about giving, right? I mean, St. Baldrick's, um, they're, you know, um, and, you know, with, with the student leaders, you know, formerly wingmen, what they're doing for the fifth graders and so forth. And that, you know, that, again, it speaks to the inside culture, what it's like to be a John Reed. It really is a place of caring. You know, when it says be kind on the outside, of course, kids aren't always kind. But, but you know what? In general, they are. It's just a really, um, it's, a, it's a caring, wonderful place to be. And, we, and that's really the, you know, this social and emotional piece that we really have been focusing on this year. Um, and it made me want to think also about, you know, um, you know, not only mentioned the adorable little ones, I'm going to tell you that our middle schools are getting a little antsy, they're getting a little full of themselves, which is exactly what you expect in middle school at this time. Our fifth graders are strutting around a little bit, you know, they're running in the hallways, eighth graders are done, they're ready for high school. I mean, it's normal, it's wonderful, and, and, and it really does, it feels great, but it's different, you know, and, and, it, and it's so amazing. Um, I was talking to Matt Goodwin today, and he, he said it, it's stunning how mature, like a seventh grader, especially a boy, um, you know, I know I'm stereotyping, but how they grow from the beginning of seventh grade to the end, it's like, it's like they're two different people. And that's, you know, and we're feeling all that and it's normal and we have so many activities going on. Um, it's really, it's, it's, just, it's just a great feeling. And I just wanna mention one more thing. Um, you notice we have some new personnel um, and, I, and I've teased Darlene that maybe in next year in retirement, I'm gonna start like a personnel agency and maybe she can work with me because we've done a lot of hiring this year. Um, and, and we've been very fortunate because they've been wonderful additions. And I, I want to give a shout out to our head custodian, um, Stephen Seifert, because he's not just our head custodian, he is an integral part of our lunch and recess now. I mean, nobody asked him to do that, but he's in there, he mentors the kids, he interacts with them, he role models for them. I mean, that, you know, that's just the kind of stuff that goes on on a daily basis. That is, you might not see it you know, in a report, but I want to share that with you and it's, um, it's a wonderful feeling. And thank you for walking with me through my house. Um, <laughs> I hope that wasn't too much of a distraction. So that's our report for tonight. And um, any questions, of course, I'd love to hear them. Thank you, that was great. Any questions or comments from anybody? Heather? I have a question. Um, it was mentioned in the last meeting, um, I think it was the last meeting about the school play. And I had a thought uh -huh. um, that perhaps something could be done outside. Um, and it, my kids did the Shakespeare program at New Pond Farm. It was all outside. They were never inside. They did a whole Shakespeare play and it was originally designed for middle school students. Mm -hmm. And, um, maybe that's something that we could think about to provide that kind of opportunity for the middle school to be performing. Cause I know there are kids that are really missing it. And then also, um, maybe that's something that would be um, offered as part of the summer program okay. as well. Yeah, thank good you. Thought. That's a good suggestion. We'll look into that. And congratulations to the um, student council uh, yes. officers, <laughs> right? On yep. behalf of the board. Can I? Yeah, thank you. Other questions on the John Reed report? Seeing none, thank you, Dr. Amore. Thank you. That moves us on to item 7A of the agenda, which is the superintendent's recommendation for non-renewals, which is a, an agenda item that whenever it comes up, I think gives people a pit in their stomach. This is a um, function of the fact that we had a number of folks filling in for long-term subs in the past, for, for long-term leaves of absence this year. And I think um, what the superintendent is gonna recommend is a non-renewal of several members of the staff. And it is not a reflection on their uh, performance in any way. And I'll let him speak to that. But first I'm gonna share my screen with the recommended motion. I'm gonna ask for the motion and then I'll let Dr. Harrison and the board comment on the motion. So we're looking for a motion that the Reading Board of Education determine that the contracts of employment for the following teachers be terminated effective July 1, 2020, 
due to reduction in force. Amanda Basso, Stephanie Boyd, Erin Hannigan, Marsha Callen, Pervy Rana, Jeanette Thompson, and Rachel Williams. The superintendent of schools is directed to advise such person in writing of this action. And um, before we open up to the board, Dr. Harrison, do you wanna make any comments about the motion? Sure, just a brief comment. And um, Chris, you made the, the most important part of this, uh, th this comment already. Uh, and that's simply that this is not a reflection of their uh, performance. Uh, and so typically, uh, or often when we hear the word uh, non-renewal, um, it is because we are parting ways with an employee um, um, as a result of, of uh, performance concerns. Uh, that's not the case in this, um, in this setting. Uh, this is, uh, these are employees, uh, as you mentioned, that were on a one-year contract. And, um, uh, and, and so it is, uh, it is the, the foundation for making uh, this recommendation. And, um, you know, on behalf of the principals, I would say that these are folks who have uh, been working hard uh, with our students during a really, really tough time. Uh, and uh, so it's just important to note that uh, that it's not in relationship to that, uh, and um, but but because of the reduction in force, and um, uh, and we will follow up. We we notified these employees prior to tonight's meeting that this would be a, an, a, an agenda item. Uh, gave them an opportunity to talk through and. Um, with their union representation, any questions that they might have, and we'll follow up with them uh, as well after this meeting uh, and um, to make sure we're able to answer any lingering questions. Thank you. And I accidentally took it out of order. I'm going to look for that motion first. If somebody could move the motion. Mike, is there a second? Heather, thank you. So Chris, go ahead. No, I just it also, is a, if I'm not mistaken, it is required that this be done in public, correct? That is correct. correct. This is this is a statutory step. This isn't so a public shaming uh, or anything. Point being that that you know, if the, if members of the public are thinking, "Gee, why are we bringing this up in a public session?" It's because it's required to do so. Chris, this is Natalie. I, I know it's not my turn to talk, but I, it says 2020. I believe. Are you referencing yeah, 2020? You're correct. Thank you. It's been a very long 2020 now. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to assume uh, Mike and Heather amend their motion to, to reflect 2021. Thank you. Yep. Uh, any other questions for the administration or comments on, on the motion? If there aren't, I'm going to take it off the screen and call the question. Heather? Yes. Colleen? Yes. Mike? Yes. John? Yes. Steph? Yes. Chris Hawker? Yes. I vote yes. The motion carries seven to zero. That brings us to item 7B on the agenda, which is policies first reading, which have been distributed to the board in their packets. The first is policy 4000.1, personnel policy regarding prohibition of sex discrimination and sexual harassment in the workplace personnel. And the second is 5145.44, students policy regarding Title IX of Education Amendments of 1972, prohibition of sex discrimination and sexual harassment. These are both on for a first reading. For background, they're coming to the board tonight because they are amendments required to our policies to bring them up to speed with the uh, regulatory changes to Title IX regulations from the Trump administration. And so it's on the advice of council that we update our, our, our policies to reflect the change in administrative guidance. And so I would look for a motion from somebody to accept for a first reading policy 4000.1. So moved. Heather, second, Chris Hawker. Any discussion on 4000.1 this evening? And it'll come back for a second reading next month also. And also to clarify, this is the policy only. The regulation has been in included for reference, but we're only moving with respect to the policy. Okay, that was one of my questions. There was some, yeah, go ahead, Colleen. Um, so I'm probably showing my poker hand right now. So the, these are um, much more substantial drafts than I recall seeing in the past. 
Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's because I haven't read a policy recently. I'm wondering how much of this has come from our policy committee and how much of this is really at the advice of our council. So the, the policy itself on 4,000.1 is about two and a half pages and then a few legal references for another page and a half. Mm -hmm. um, it's dense and, and legalese. It was reviewed and recommended by the joint policy committee that the three boards adopt this policy because it brings us into compliance with, with the law. And so none of what is in there is there because we're trying to add any obligations or, or requirements. This is a policy drafted through our council and recommended by our council, went to the policy committee that reviewed it and recommended it to the board. Okay, and then, so um, my next question is, if this policy were in force today, um, do we know how closely we are adhering to the, um, to the policy uh, as it stands, as it's written? Do you mean how well is the district currently in compliance with the Title IX regulations to which this policy maps? Yeah, you may, you said it so nicely. Yes, I, I think I'll, I'll let Stephanie speak to it, but it's my understanding that we're we're following the the legal regulations where they are in conflict with our existing policies. Stephanie, we are in fact so so. Um, we have been following the new regulations really since the start of the year. So you, there are some changes on the website. Um, there has been some additional training for all administrators regarding the new Title IX regulations. So uh, we were actually already following this before the policy went to the board for readings. Okay, thank you. Yeah. When, it, when it comes to legal requirements, statutory or regulatory, they always take priority over whatever our policy is. And if our policy is out of date, we have to amend it to bring it into line with that. But the, the statutes and the regulations are, are what's gonna control. Okay, thank you. And the motion, the motion, oh, go ahead. Go the ahead. motion that we have right now is just for the first one, right? It's, it's, it's a first reading of the first one, 4,000.1. Yes. Chris? Yeah, just uh, to what extent does the policy committee get involved in the administrative regulations part of it? Uh, that's just curiosity. We haven't. We, we have limited our review to, to the policy level and delegated the regulation. Right. Okay. So that for those of you who may not have had a chance to look through all this, that, you know, 80% of what you got was, was, were the regulations that, you know, are drafted, suggested by the council. I will tell you that uh, in, for both of these, the regulations are very similar. I won't say they're identical, but they're very similar. Any other questions or comments on policy 4,000.1 for a first reading? And obviously if you think of anything between now and and next month, you can either note it to have that conversation at the next meeting, or you can bring it to the attention of the Joint Policy Committee, and we'd be happy to provide feedback on any of those, those questions, either through me or John Stinson, who chairs that, that committee. So uh, for the first readings, calling the question, Heather? Yes. Colleen? Yes. Mike? Yes. John? Yes. Steph? Yes. Chris Hawker? Yes. I vote yes, motion carries 7-0. Look for a motion to accept for first reading policy 5145.44. Heather? Second. Second, John, thank you. Any discussion on this policy? Yes, uh, I haven't, it's, we've got a combined 49 pages of reading to do here um, <laughs> and, and I haven't done it yet. Um, I you know, would just like to ask, does this have anything to do with um, say, you know, boys participating in girls sports? No, to my knowledge, this is, this is a reflection of the amendments to regulations under Title IX that were promulgated by the, uh, by the prior administration. And my, my reading, and I didn't, I didn't spend like half a day reading, but I, I did read through them and, uh, and I have to admit, I was curious as to what all was in there. 
to me, it was straightforward sort of uh, on uh, sexual har harassment and sex discrimination without any of the thorny stuff that, you know, people get all exercised about uh, lately. It, that, that, it was was my, my, that was my if, impression. If I recall correctly, and Stephanie might be closer to this than, than I am, it's a function of the sort of due process and reporting obligations and rights that changed with respect to the process under Title IX. And those regulations change, our policy have to change in, in sort of course. But Stephanie, you can give a little bit more context. Yeah, I mean, so the major changes include uh, a change in the investigation process and additional roles that um, are included. So to ensure that, for instance, the the person who receives the complaint does not conduct the investigation and then also make the judgment to determine whether the facts are sufficient to determine that discrimination has occurred. But there are several roles so that that um, adds a layer of subjectivity. And um, there's some more comprehensive professional development that's attached to this uh, policy change. And um, then also just uh, the availability of information to the public on the website. And, and again, just uh, compliance with um, process in terms of, of, of disputes and, and the steps that need to be taken by the district. It's very process oriented. And to, to give you sort of a preview of deja vu a year from now, um, it, all indications are that the Biden administration is going to promulgate new regulations that are going to require another amendment to the policy once those come out. So don't get too comfortable with what you're seeing here because it'll probably get changed in the next year or two. Chris, I saw something in the first paragraph that made um, me believe that this would in fact apply to board members, um, but it wasn't crystal clear. The first it's paragraph something of D145? along the lines of, yeah, I believe, I believe this, that's one of those 24 pages. 25. And yeah. I apologize, I don't have it pulled up here. Um, but it, it yeah, it referenced um, a board, um, people, people who were influenced by the board versus employees per se. Uh, I don't see the language that you're flagging, but if you're okay, I'll withdraw then. And then uh, bring to the policy committee. Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. I, I saw something that referenced, it wasn't clear. Yeah. Okay. That That's helpful. If anybody sees anything they're concerned about, obviously let us know. Any further questions or comments on first reading of 5145.44? If there aren't, we'll call the question. Heather? Yes. Colleen? Yes. Mike? Yes. John? Yes. Steph? Yes. Chris Hawker? Yes. I vote yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. That moves us on to district administrator reports, item eight on the agenda. And why don't we start with Ms. Del Conte and special education, please? So, this is actually a very busy time in special services. Um, this is where we start thinking about transitioning kids. Um, you know, we say goodbye to our eighth graders and we, um, we coordinate with Bala to make sure that um, they can continue with their special education program. Uh, we also um, are doing transition meetings from RES to John Reed. So we spend a lot of time um, really working with the parents and with the receiving schools to make sure that uh, there's continuity in the student program. Uh, we also are um, in the process of transitioning our youngest learners, our pre-K, you know, into our kindergarten program. So we're starting that process as well. So um, speaking of pre-K, um, one of the initiatives we took this year was to really redesign our preschool handbook. 
So our teachers have been working um, tirelessly to, um, they presented us with a draft of the new preschool handbook, which hopefully is um, codifying, you know, what um, our preschool is all about. Um, people have said that our preschool is a, um, a hidden gem, and I have to agree, we've got great staff, we've got great student and a great program. So we actually are in the process of um, editing our handbook and hopefully that will be up on the website. So in terms of our special education numbers, they are fairly consistent from the, uh, the last month. Um, I do have to say that um, through, I think through a true partnership and collaboration with the, um, the SIT teams in both RES and John Reed, we've been able to make sure the interventions are in place before students are referred to special services. And I think you see that in the numbers. Um, last April, we, um, we were at 20.2%, which is very high. And this year we are down to 17.9%. That's really, I think, speak to the commitment and dedication to making sure that we've got the right supports and the right interventions for our kids. And again, um, we really are spending this month um, really talking about uh, transition planning. And we also are um, looking at extended school year. So like I said, this really is a very busy time for special services. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Jen. Any questions on the board? Just, just to keep track of any surprises, any changes in terms of uh, uh, the numbers that, that may require services that you perhaps were not expecting, let's say last month? You mean from last month or from, um, from last year? Uh, I think Chris's question is really getting at, are there any uh, additional outplacements or expensive cases right. that, that exactly. are going to hit us? And now, that, now that we have the Board of Finance uh, approved <laughs> budget, I just... But I, I, also want, I also want to caution you, and I've said this um, many times, is um, the numbers only tell part of the story. We have to look at the intensity of the student that we have. And I, I'm just going to use this as an example. We um, we split last um, last year. We split our basis program at RES into two distinct programs. That was probably the best decision we ever made was to really capture the needs of the student. But I do have to say that the intensity of the student in those two basis programs probably are tenfold than they were years ago. So I think we have to keep that in mind. You know, one student could have 15 services and another student can only have two services. So I think we really need to, um, like I said, the numbers only tell part of the story. But there's no reason to anticipate any massive changes to the numbers at this point. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I oh, like no. think that um, I, I think that, you know, from what I do know right now is that it looks like we're holding steady. I mean, okay. we may have a few changes here and there, but I think we're pretty steady at this point. Chris, the one caution I'd say is, as uh, Natalie mentioned earlier, she had four new students. Every time there's a new student, there's a risk that one of those students may or may not have special needs. So as students come in, you're always running that risk. It's, it's a probability game. Yep. Um, I had the good fortune of um, chatting with some families, not in Reading, but some families that are experiencing um, special services in other districts. And it's so um, enlightening to really hear and understand their stories because I don't think you really... Um, as a parent with a student in general ed, I don't think you really get it until you hear, um, you know, what another family, the challenges another family uh, is facing. Um, and um, one of the things they talked to me about is how important, um, you know, state state and federal legislation is. Is there any changes to legislation that you're anticipating that could impact how we provide services or the types of learning differences that we're looking for and how we serve them? 
I can't speak to um, what I know of legislative changes. I do know that um, we still have to provide services for our students. You know, our our legal obligation and our ethical obligation remains um, unchanged at this time. So, um, but I think what do, I, I do have to thank the board for its um, its vision of um, creating a continuum of services, and I think that is. Um, that should be congratulated to the board for really looking at making sure that we can keep students at home. Thank you, Jen. Any other questions? All right, if there aren't, we can move on to Mr. Zachary and the financials, please. Good evening, uh, Mr. Parkin. Can you put up the transfer report, please? So. We I'm gonna to try to go through that quickly because I need to spend some time on, I sent you all the, what I'm calling the health claims analysis tonight. I'm, I need to spend some time talking about that. Uh, we just got the necessary data yesterday. So we churned out the report. So we can start with transfers. We'll go through that quickly. If you have any questions? There we go, it should be up now. All right, so you know we've got $7,000 in change of transfers. The majority of it is 6,000 from uh, the sub para custodian non-cert uh, line to maintenance supplies. So basically we needed some additional supplies. So we transferred out of that account. The other one's you know, less than a thousand dollars. I don't, don't want to waste too much time talking about this. It's not, this is sort of run of the mill things, but if you guys have any questions, I'm willing to uh, go into further detail. Doesn't look like it. Do you want to switch over to- uh, Go to the budget oh. summary, please. Sure, just a second. So as you, as you guys are probably aware, we've been having issues with our new uh, system. We finally got our budget object summary report uh, operational, uh, which is a welcome thing. Um, I want to uh, guide you through this. So this is the new format that you'll be seeing going forward. Uh, we've broken down by location, each one of the object codes. So you can sort of see even by building uh, what's happening. So you'll start off the... Uh, Actual expenditures on the left, what's budgeted for this year. MTD is month to date. So that's the actual month, uh, what we've expended the month to date. The month to date is embedded in the YTD, which is year to date. Encumbered is things we've encumbered. And the far right is unexpended budget left. And that year to date budget is percentage of how much of the budget line that we've utilized. Mr. Parkin, if you can go down to the last page of that. Sure. And just to be clear, the, the Y2D budget, that's the amount spent. That doesn't include the encumbrances. It does not include encumbrances. Correct. So I, I keep, I'm getting this multiple questions from all three just about, you know, what's our anticipation for what we have left at the, towards the end of the year. So uh, I want you to see this, but I want to clarify something. That 5.5 million you show there is available funds does not include what's remaining left to be paid in salaries and Social Security. So if I back out the salaries and Social Security, which is 88% of that number, which is, uh, let me pull it up here, I got it. Salaries and Social Security work are, are approximately $4.9 million of that 5.5. So you can see most of that money will disappear in the next three months. Uh, what I find interesting, you see it's at 75%. March concludes the, the third quarter, which is three quarters of the year. So we're basically right on schedule budget-wise. We've through three quarters of the year, we've spent uh, spent or encumbered three quarters of our funds. If you further back out transportation, electricity, and gas, things that are sort of non-negotiable, uh, that number, we end up having about $418,000 left that we have some discretion over. That works out to be about 1.86% 1. of the overall budget that we're sort of gonna be monitoring for the next three months. Um, so I'll open up any questions there. So if, if not, then we can move on to healthcare, which I think may take some time. Chris, can you scroll back up? There's one number. It's a, it's a low dollar number, but the percentage is way off. Um, or I shouldn't say way off right there. Um, 1200%. What is that telling? What is that telling me? What a number. It's telling, it's telling you we budgeted $1,400 but we spent $16,000. So it's the percentage, you shouldn't focus on the percentage because in that case it's, it's textbooks and you see the uh, 
the line budget was 1400 at RES and 550 at John Reed, but we've spent 16,006 at John Reed and 3,333 at- uh, Is that the prepayment on the K-5 math books? Yes, exactly. <laughs> this is what you all agreed for us to do in order to get the, spread the pricing out. Thank you. And this allows us to start the PD on the new math curriculum in this fiscal year also. Correct. And I think you've just answered it, but 23 is, is the John Reed building and 24 is the RES building code. Correct. And so that people don't look at this and think, why are we spending zero on administration? This is because oh. these are these are new item object codes that you've inputted this year that will be reflected on next year's Correct. budget going forward. Correct. That shows the new uh, our new accounting structure. So you'll see the details, so you'll get a breakout whether it be administration salaries, SPAD administration salaries, give you a little more granular detail. So we've got to get through these last three months of sort of this hybrid, then next year and next year's budget, we see this and all those numbers we filled in going forward. Now, what you, what you won't see next year is under actual expenditures for 2021 for those lines, because there was nothing in those accounts, but over time that'll all fill in. Right. In two years, we'll be able to look left to right and it'll exactly. all make sense. Correct. If I no noticed that we've gone from from electricity back to electricity do not use as where we're we're dropping our electricity. No, we we have a new electricity account, so that code do not use means going forward next year. Don't put in no one's supposed to put any any money in there, so that's why it says do not use. <laughs> but you're still using electricity. That's good. <laughs> yes, sir. We are. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. If you could. Uh, comment on sort of the status of the special uh, ed excess cost adjustment. Are we, are we expecting to get, or have we already gotten roughly what we uh, assumed at the beginning of this budget year? Do you know? Typically they let us know in March, but that sometimes yeah. can be delayed based on the state's budget. Uh, I haven't heard any numbers yet from the state, so I think they're trying to figure how much money they can afford to give out. So until we get that number, I can't really answer that question. Okay, so so we've not gotten any any first payments or anything. We have no idea. No, I, I, not that I'm aware of, because I, I typically try to, you know, that's one of the key questions I have. Cause I need to know what the what the percentage is going to be and what the amount's going to be. But uh, as of March, just ended last week, so they, I'm hoping to hear it relatively soon. Okay. And so that number would come off of. The seventy-four thousand, I would assume, would bring that down, which yep. would change the unexpended at the bottom. Yeah. But that's always a wild card. It's it's always a wild card, exactly. Yeah. And we just it when we when we budget it, we budget this an assumption, and then as the year goes by, you know, we come March or you know May and June, you adjust it based on you know what the actual dollars turn out to be. All right. Other questions on the object summary before we move on to health insurance? All right. So first of all, I, I took the liberty of renaming the report because uh, I, 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 we don't have insurance per se. This report is really about health claims. So I, I renamed it the uh, Reading Health Claims Analysis. As you recall, uh, Anthem uh, migrated their systems in January. And we said there was gonna be some lower claims number. Then February came around and it was virtually no claims. And we said, well, we gotta to wait to March. Well, March came and uh, Ms. Parker, you enlarge that a little bit, please. There you go. So if you look at that, uh, that number on the, on the claims from March, 729,000, that's basically a combination of January, February and March. What's alarming about that number, the average of those three months, uh, January, February, March is $288,000 worth of claims for the last, those three months. But then you factor in the previous two months, November, December, it averages out to be a, almost a, a $314,000 a month in claims. So if you, Ms. Park, if you scroll up a little bit, please. Mm -hmm. So here's the concern. We've got, uh, $162,000 in reserves in the, in, the, in the bank as of the end of March. 
Ms. Parker, scroll up a little bit further, please. So if we, uh, if we've, uh, our deposit, so my concern is we're, if we continue on this average of claims, we're probably gonna breach $3 million in claims paid. Cause you see that 2.4 million in claims paid, that's through March. So if we're averaging 269, 288 in the last three months and 314 in the last five months, even if we average 200,000 200, a month, that's gonna be an additional $600,000 in claims. That's gonna put us over the $3 million mark for the year. And we, we, were, we were trending poorly for most of the year, but I just, I just wanted to make sure the board's aware that we will, as you see there, the lowest, if you exclude the January, February, the lowest claim month we had was 168,000. 250, 240, 357. So it, it, the claims history has not been uh, optimal. Uh, but we need to be make sure we're aware uh, how that's going to pan out. As I say, we've got $162,000 in the uh, reserve fund as of the end of March. Don't know what claims are going to be coming in, um, but we need to be cognizant of the fact that that claims history has not been optimal and we need to be prepared uh, if need be to uh, take some additional actions. Do we know if we've hit the stop loss anywhere that might provide some individual relief? Uh, Reading has not. So uh, one of the other districts ha ha has, but Reading has not. Chris? Yeah, to be clear. So essentially, this is information that you literally just got a day or two ago, right? Uh, let's put it this way. Vicki got the report, her part yesterday. She did her part and I got what you're seeing, the information that I put here at 4.30 today. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, but, but my point is that, that not only is it alarming, it's like brand new in yeah. the sense that it, it, th there were no numbers to anticipate essentially between, you know, for the entire quarter, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so like we knew, like we knew something was coming because we we had a very large that 729. We had a very large payment that came at you know the uh, in March, and we were like something big's coming because they we, when they we knew something was big because we got, we saw the withdrawal because we had to pay for the claims. So we just didn't know where it was because when they withdraw, all the districts are, are combined together. So we didn't know how it was allocated and broken down between the three districts. Turns out, you know, it, it, it was a good portion of it was ready. Great. But but that's a, f a function to some extent of, of the switching of the software program. Yes, yeah, so our lack of, of, of foresight on it is a function of their migration in January. So you see, we were at 349 in December, we dropped down to 131 in January and then down to $3,000 in February. So February, literally like as if nothing happened in February, and then you see the surge of almost seven hundred thirty thousand dollars in March because. The... So you, you knew you knew that was wrong, but you just you, you had no idea how wrong it was. Correct. We knew that we knew the number wasn't reflective of the actual claims. We just had to right, wait right. for the data to flow through to get, to find out. Great. So um, if you if you look at the bottom there, you see the year to day average claims per month is two sixty nine. Last year was two thirty, and our three year average is two twenty two. So it. it it has not been a good year uh, claims wise for Reading. So I, my, my obligation to make you all aware of that. So we have to keep an eye, uh, you know, these last, this last quarter uh, to see where we end up over that reserve balance down to, think about it. You start a year off with a reserve balance, I think 181. So you're already dipped in below where you start the year off. And I, my understanding is you made a big contribution last year to get that 181 there. Clarence, 189, I'm sorry. Clarence, can you um, explain again um, how or what number I should compare to the 3 million it's possible we might spend? I was looking down writing notes and I missed where I where my eyes should go on this. Can you go back up to the top, please? Report. So if you see on the left says claims paid. Yep. You scroll across, you'll see in, in 16, 17, you had a $3 million claims paid. 
if we go to 2021, we're at $2.4 million at the end of March. Mm-hmm. If we're averaging t- almost 270 per month in the last three months, so if you s- assume we average 200,000 per month, we have three mm-hmm. months left, so that's an additional 600,000. So the 2.4 plus a 600 gives you over $3 million. And that's just, a, at this point, I would say conservative estimate at $200,000 per month, given that we've been averaging, you know, 269 the last three months and 300,000 the last five months. And is there something there that would, that indicates how short we would be if we were to spend the 3 million? No, because it all, as you scroll down from the 2.4, you see the contributions there. The contributions vary. Yeah. There's always going to be premium contributions. So it, that sort of offsets us not knowing what's coming and going now. Sometimes you see the last ones, the BOE approve additional contributions. That yeah. may be, that's what I'm alerting you that we may have to go that route. And that's the money that we moved last June 30th to Correct. bring us to the, the starting balance of 471. Yes. Or, or 500 rather. Yes. 189 plus 310 is what we yeah. really started the year at. So, so even though this report doesn't show how short we would be, is there a way to forecast that? Just so I have a, you don't have to answer me right now. You don't have to forecast it right now, but just so I could have kind of a, an understanding. Are we talking, you know, what are we talking? So how short, how short might we be? The, the issue is I can't predict what people's claims are gonna be, but if, if you take the three, if, Chris, you can scroll down, please. If you just assume the year to day average, uh-huh. the 269, 512 times three, add it to the 2.4, and that would give you a, a reasonable place to start off. as how what the claims will be, and then, the issue becomes what, what are the offsets from the contributions? Because that gets you to about 3.2. And if you look historically, you figure you're in for about $100,000 more in employee contribution coming yep. in. And if this is based on budget, you're looking at another couple hundred thousand dollars coming in from our budgeted expectation because everything doesn't, everything's not sitting there now. It's, it's accrued on a monthly. So, um, if you're trying to get away from 800 something thousand and you're putting in another 700, you're probably $100,000 light, more or less, on this number. And Mr. Park is noting that month to month, the numbers have been wildly inconsistent, right? So yeah. I, you can take, all I can say is you don't know until you get there. You, you know, there's really no, there's really no pattern that you could, that I could see that says, oh yeah, well, we're gonna end up, you know, okay or not okay or something in between. I don't see it. Chris, the the pattern that we might've been able to discern was obliterated when they did the migration and the numbers for January through March, they just, there's nothing, you can't really do anything with that. Right, Right. and I'm sure uh, just like everything else in this year, it's just, impossible to have that much degree of certainty and you also can't go back and look at the fiscal 16 17 and 18 numbers to look for patterns because most of the bargaining unit members were on different styled plans at that point and so behavior is going to be slightly different in a high deductible universe than in a a ppo universe can i ask um what might be a stupid question um if we were an insurance company and we had these claims coming in, we would have some idea of what the claims were for. So we could know if this is something that's going to be ongoing. We have, we have um, people that are going to be requiring a high expensive level of healthcare for the next six months to a year. Um, we have no way of knowing any of that. Yes, we do. But for okay. uh, privacy reasons, we don't discuss that because you might be able to identify the employee right. or family member that needs the services. Right. But so do we have an idea of can we anticipate very high claims for the next several months? Is my I question. would say yes. Based on when we start seeing the $300,000 claims back in November, and December, we start asking that exact question. Like, is this a one time thing or. Right. And, and it was there are some uh, there are some. Uh, claimants that have some significant issues that are not going to go away anytime soon. Got it. 
But we might also see some of them hitting hitting the stop loss if exactly. they are significant. Yeah, if you hit the stop loss, then, then it, it, it's right. sort of a, a pressure release valve. Right. The bottom could fall out in May as a result of several stop losses that have been sort of accruing over the course of the year. But, or but we or don't know sooner, if, if it were one, one person or two people, it would be sooner. Right. In theory. I have a question. Clarence, we're paying uh, Anthem to process and report these claims, right? Correct. Um, and this uh, migration of software was all on their side, it had nothing to do with our mi migration of software, right? Correct. So I have to say, I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed in the service. So uh, just to give you any, uh, just a personal experience, I joined a district in November. My previous employer had Anthem, different format, but had Anthem. I got an Anthem card for e ER9 in December. I got another one in January of the migration. I got another one yesterday, which purportedly canceled my previous one I got in January, but had what, less coverage on it than the one I had in January. So Vic had spent time today calling like explaining which one's the right card, because one had medical, dental, and something else, and one didn't have dental. I'm like, well, wh what am I supposed to have? So I have two different IDs with Anthem, with ER9, and I don't know which one is the right one to use. Do you think that's widespread? Like, is there a service failure? I don't know, failure is my- I don't, look, having gone through a, 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 a technology platform migration myself in the last four months, I get it, things happen. And things happen to them, and, I, and it's one of these things where you just got you just got to ride out the bumps. There's not really much you can do about it. You just have to ride out the bumps. I'm just disappointed that we went through the entire uh, length of budget season uh, without any numbers, you know, on claims, and we're making decisions based upon old data. Mike, I appreciate that. I, I, I tried to you know, be the canary and say, look, these numbers, there's, there's something out there. I, don't, I can't tell you what it is. And I, I apologize if I wasn't. I'm not. No, no, I'm not putting that on you. I'm talking about I'm talking about Anthem and that we're paying them for the service of processing and reporting the claims. And they're not, you know, I, I, I feel like they're not meeting their obligations when they're reporting three months late. Has Brown and Brown um been in touch about this at all and have they experienced similar problems with other anthem clients uh my understanding is yes because it was not it was not it's the migration affected everyone that it is an it issue is my understanding you know it, it's it, we're so reliant on technology i don't know if you once try to get an emissions test done recently but guess what you can't do it because there's a malware attack on the dmv's vendor and it's like you know, what do you do with that? It's just, it's just, it's, it's, we're dependent on the technology and the technology that fails us, then we, we get upset and frustrated, but it's, it helps us when things are running smoothly. When it's not running smoothly, we get, you know, perturbed. Heather, did I see your hand up? No, I was just going to make a snarky comment about the health insurance industry. <laughs> <laughs> So like I said, I, I had to be the, the bearer of, of alarming news, but I just want to make you all aware of this, that we have to keep our eye on this and for the last three months. And it's just something that we got to be play close particular attention. The problem I have for Reading is generally speaking, we get the data at the beginning of the month. And it's just like today, your meetings are generally right as I'm getting the data or, after, or right before I get the data. So I have uh, problems getting the information to you based on just when the meeting schedule is. Uh, I have another question. Have they uh, normalized their flow? You know, are we are we are they through the uh, the migration and now prepared to, you know, get back to you on a timely basis with claims? That is my understanding. That's why you see that large number in March. They they said it, it would it will flow through through March, and after that, everything should get back to normal. All right. We'll see you in a month. <laughs> Neither uh, questions. Anyone questions for me? Yep. Thank you, Clarence. I'll take this down. 
Any other district administrative reports? Dr. Harrison, anything else tonight? Um, no, I, I just pointed out the, um, just some of the pieces related to the federal funds during Dr. Pearson Ugal's report. I did want to mention, um, I know that uh, Dr. Mori has sent out some information regarding graduation or the moving up ceremony for uh, eighth grade um, at the end of this year. We recently got some uh, new information from the governor's office and we are expecting some additional information coming from uh, CSD re regarding um, recommendations related to graduation. Uh, and so I uh, just wanted to make note to the board and um, Dr. Murray will share with the community that we will be amending our um, initial plans and thoughts related to that um, end of the year programming. Uh, so rather than doing um, a sort of drive-by um, uh, event for the end of the school year to celebrate our eighth graders, uh, we'll have a more uh, traditional in-person um, uh, ceremony with an audience. And so more to come on those details. Can I Thank ask you, what about so um, RES? More to come. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we too have been in waiting mode. Um, we didn't want to make a, a decision January, February, March. We know things are changing and moving every day. So um, stay tuned. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. If there are no other district administrative reports, I'll look for any board committee reports. Just I, go ahead, Heather. I can report um, that the DEI task force uh, met and we will be presenting at the next um, tri-board meeting. Um, I encourage everybody to come to these meetings. They are very interesting, very enlightening. And I think that some of the reports that you we have heard from both students from Reading and also staff members will make you very, very, very proud of the people that we have in our community. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the, I think the third Wednesday of April is the next meeting and I just uh, encourage everyone to come. Thank you, Heather. And I would just note with respect to the joint ER9 policy committee, we had uh, put on the calendar a meeting for this Thursday evening and encouraged all 21 board members across the three districts to attend as we were going to be soliciting feedback with respect to tri-district governance and dispute resolution to try to improve the, the ways of working between the three boards. Because both Region 9 and Easton have now scheduled special meetings of their boards on that evening, um, the policy committee feedback meeting is gonna be put over two weeks until the 22nd, which I believe is the night after the DEI task force meeting on the 21st, so. Uh, it's the 22nd of, say it again, April? Okay. Of April, yeah. So, so postpone two weeks. The goal of the, the policy committee is going to be to solicit feedback from board members on preferences for dispute resolution and tri-board governance so that the policy committee can craft something uh, to bring to the tri-boards in May to, to agree upon. So. Or not. All <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Any other uh, committee reports for this evening? All right, if there aren't any, we'll move to item 10 on the agenda, public comment. Anyone wishing to make comment, please use the reactions button to raise their hand or otherwise make themselves known. Seeing none, moving on to board member comment. Any board member comment? I just wanna thank everybody for uh all the cooperation and participation during this budget season and uh, to say that it was a pleasure to have our um, new superintendent and director of finance uh, in the process and I realized how incredibly valuable it is to have um, fresh eyes on what we're doing here and be able to talk a little bit about what uh, how things are done in different districts also that was um, something that I really appreciated learning thanks. Thank you, Heather. John? Yeah, I would echo what Heather said, but also I'd like to just um, especially thank the folks that we weren't able to bring back for 21, 22. I know it was difficult for 
uh, for everybody involved in that process. Um, and I just want to thank them uh, for their service to, to our students as well. Thank you, John. Any other board member comment? If there is not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Mike is our second. Heather, any objection? Seeing none, we are adjourned.